Yeah. Well, let's make that not happen. All right, welcome everybody. I'm Ingi.net. I'm going to, this is a, give a talk about the state of the ACT Museum in 2012. I'm not really sure where this talk's going to go exactly. Um, well, we'll just see. Okay, so a few things about me. Um, I have a bunch of CPAN modules. There's a reason for me to say this. And um, my first one was inline, and that lets you write Perl. Yeah, sure. Good? Okay. Sorry, a little technical difficulties here. Germany. <laughs> We're back. Um, <clears throat> so inline was pretty cool because you could write Perl in 25 different languages right in your Perl code. Um, some other languages, I think Python and Ruby, actually have their versions of inline now so they can at least write C code. I don't think they went the full Perl route of 25, but, uh, you know, it's pretty cool. Um, <clears throat> YAML was kind of a big deal for, um, you know, getting data between languages in a, in a nice way. Yeah, YAML. Yeah, YAML. Um, Gemplet is uh, a port of template toolkit to JavaScript, so you can take a giant library of template toolkit um, templates, and they just work in JavaScript. Um, that's pretty cool. So that involves two languages. And pQuery is another one that's in reverse, um, you know, taking some JavaScript love and, and bringing it back to Perl. Um, it's jQuery in Perl, roughly. And so, interestingly, the pQuery one was a straight port. I just actually went line for line of the JavaScript code and converted it to Perl. Um, and at some point, I think it was in 09 or such, I was at OzCon and then I was writing a YAML talk and I realized that there was kind of this, this theme of involving multiple languages in these proje projects. Um, so, <clears throat> and I kind of saw, like, speaking of OzCon was that, you know, people were going to this conference that supported multiple languages. They have a big keynote and everyone says hello and then they go off to their separate corners and, you know, talk Ruby or talk... Um, Perl or Python or whatever, and then they come back for the ending thing. So it's, it's kind of weird, you know. So it would, it would be really good if um, more people were talking more. And it was basically just the language boundary that separated people. I mean, sometimes you might have some, well, it was really weird because, I, I mean, what, what kind of talk would actually draw multiple people? That YAML talk actually had equal people from Perl, Python, and Ruby, and a, a few less in JavaScript, but um, there's not really YAML in JavaScript. But... It was cool. I mean, I, I didn't really set that up, but um, people from the different languages showed up. So um, anyway, the languages kind of separate us artificially. Um, so the languages don't matter, but the people do, and the ideas do. Um, I tend to think that computer ideas, I mean, computers are fascinating in that if we didn't dick around and try to make money off them um, and, you know, get a head up for the quarter or something like that, um, that we could actually use them to create a much better world. So uh, the idea is don't let language stop that, and I call that idea acmeism. Oh, yeah, I'm not going to explain why I call it acmeism, but um, I started calling it acmeism, and now it's called acmeism, and that's its name. You know, It's like, why, was, why did my parents name me Ingi? I don't know. <laughs> you know? I don't know the .NETs are, are a weird family. Yes, but, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I have a little website at acmeism.org. Just a little blurb, it's really not much of anything. But um, the goals of Acmeism are to bring communities together by sharing ideas in, in ways that transcend languages. And I don't limit the term Acmeism to programming. I think it's a general thing. It's like when, you know, I've spent um, a lot of time in Asia and a, a lot of time in, in, in France and got to talk in broken speech to some really brilliant people. And, um, but there's a language barrier, you know why most of the French people live in France and most of the uh, Chinese people live in Taiwan. <laughs> so <clears throat> tomorrow Miyagawa is going to give a talk about polyglot, and that's kind of a new word that's been showing up in our vocabularies in programming in um, the last couple of years. Um, and it just means many languages, polyglot. Um, 
but Polyglot is really more about just using multiple languages, you know. I mean, we do it all the time now. We use, you know, JavaScript with Perl and various web situations. Um, but Acme isn't really isn't about that. It's not so much about using different languages. It's about taking some idea and just not even thinking of it in terms of a language, but thinking of it in terms of how can I get this out to as broad of an audience to help as many people as possible. Now, I just want to throw a little aside in here. The first time I heard Polyglot, it had a totally different meaning, and it kicked way more ass than the way people are using it now. It was um, Shibuya.pm, which is a Japanese Perl mongers from Tokyo, um, gave this series of talks over three years that just got more insane every year. But I'll just give you the, the first one was they had a, a file. It was a program. And if you said, you know, let's call it foo, and if you said Perl foo, it, it printed hello Perl. And if you said Ruby foo, printed hello Ruby, Python foo, hello Python. And if you loaded it in IE6 as a JavaScript, uh, file, then it alerted Hello JavaScript. Um, another interesting fact about this program is there wasn't a single letter A through Z in it at all, um, just a bunch of punctuation characters. I think they boiled it down in one of the following years to seven punctuation characters. So they showed a keyboard that only had seven keys on it that you could use. And um, I think they made it into a, either an ELF or a Windows binary executor or oh, something insane. Anyway, I, yeah. I'll give you a hint of how they did it. Um, they used different commenting things that were escapes in one language and you know, allowed the code to run it. So they basically had four different sets of code where the rest of the code was a comment in the other language. And then think about um, what happens if you take open curly brace, close curly brace, and stringify it in JavaScript. What do you get? What does it print? Object. That's right. And so now you have the letters O, B, J, E, C, and T. If you index off of that string, you can use those letters, and then you, you stringify some other stuff, and you can start building up an alphabet and then just doing programming. You know, some people, some people have a little bit too much time on their hands, okay. <laughs> including myself. So, so these are my, um, kind of my highfalutin acme goals. I want to easily publish 1,000 modules in 20 different programming language um, repositories before I die, um, C, Pan, Pi, Pi, et cetera. Um, but I want there to only be one actual source code, and it, they just, you know, I write it once, and it goes to 20 places. Um, and I call that hope, heck, once, published everywhere. So the way I see it, as, I, I, as a module author, there's only four things in a module, really. It's, there's the code, the test, the documentation, and some packaging. Um, so I, I have projects for three of those. Um, one is called Cdent, and it's a, it lets you write um, a module in, the, in your one of three languages, and then currently 18, 19, or 20 back-end languages, it will um, produce an equivalent of that. Um, <clears throat> I'll show that in a bit. Um, there's something called TestML, um, where you write, it's a language for writing unit tests. Or, um, and it actually will work in any framework. So it works under TAP, it works under um, Nose, and um, the various um, unit test frameworks. It just has a, an adapter class for each framework in the, in the various languages. Um, and then I have something called Stardoc, which is more just an idea. It's basically CDent for documentation that you write it in Markdown or, or Pod or whatever, and it just gets it into the thing that the package is expected to be in on the you know, PHP pair system or whatever. So <clears throat> um, there's also one other project that's kind of underpinning all these, and I stole this one from Perl 6, um, and I hope to give it back. You know, it's an acne you can't steal without giving back. Um, the coolest thing I saw about Perl 6 was its, was its grammar st um, stuff, and it, which is used to write Perl 6 itself. And I was like, oh, all the languages need this. Hello, Mr. Polyglot. Miyagawa just came into the room for you Germans and, and Dutch <laughs> listeners. <clears throat> um, I just pimped your talk for tomorrow. Sounds cool. <laughs> You'll have to watch the, uh, the tape to see how I pimped it. <clears throat> so um, this PEGX grammar thing um, is used to uh, fuel CDent and TestML and probably Starduck when I start that. 
and we'll take a look at it. So what is the state? Because that's the title of the talk, and you want to know what the state is, so you can write home to mom. Um, the state is about the same as it was six months ago, because that's when Active State kind of took over my life and started working on the staccato project that I gave a talk. How many people were in the staccato uh, talk from yesterday? Hand, hand higher, because actually this is important to me. One, two. So not most of you weren't. So I to, I'm going to show a little bit of uh, staccato in this talk because um, staccato is somewhat acmeist. Um, the, the quick way to describe it is Heroku in a box. Do, do people know what Heroku is? It's um, you just push an app to a cloud and it runs. Um, staccato is the same thing. You get all the same functionality except you can run it on your laptop or you can run it in your own server system, or you can put it on EC2 or wherever you want. Um, and, but we're going to play with that in some neat ways um, that uh, wasn't really intended to be played with. So, <clears throat> but to be honest, that's more of a polyglot thing. It's just there's eight languages that it supports out of the box and then has support for adding different ones. Um, one, of, one of the apps that I've recently written for Staccato is something that does absolutely nothing. But since each Staccato app runs in its own LXC container, which is um, basically like a, a really high security cheroot and that's built into the Linux kernel now, um, you can actually, Staccato offers SSH access directly into that. So anybody that deploys an app can then SSH into the container and they have this, you know, it looks like a full Unix system, but it's not. I mean, because you list the process table and there's only like, you know, 10 processes in the whole thing. And so that's cool, but I thought what was even cooler was that the staccato lets you form groups of users. And if the app belongs to a group, then multiple people from that group can log into the same container. Bingo, you have a place to play with other programmers. And I'm going to actually play with all of you. In fact, <clears throat> Go to, let me, t this is actually Vim, so go to staca, this vanity domain, .to, if you have a laptop right now, and up at the top it will say um, staccato client or something like that. Um, you're going to need to, if you want to play along and actually have the ability to uh, rm minus fr slash oh, pseudo, that, um, <clears throat> yeah, if you want to destroy my whole talk, you can do that, but you have to get this client first. Um, so play around with that for a little bit while I blather on. <clears throat> okay. Um, so here, here's a more reasonable goal that I haven't talked to many people about at all. It's um, so I'm one of the three creators of, of the YAML spec, and that's started in 2001, so it's 11 years old now, and um, it's doing okay, but it, it was set out to do a lot better. And um, so I have this idea of YAML 2, and YAML 2 isn't a Perl module, it's not even a spec revision, it involves those things, but it's really just a revitalization of, of the YAML project, and okay, we have 10 years of experience, it's pretty good, how can we make it just awesome? So um, the two, part of the YAML 2 project is the 2.0 spec, which I decided should only be a subset, because the spec was so huge. I mean, if anybody's ever seen the spec, it's bigger than the XML spec. And there's all these features built in that didn't need to be in there and nobody ever used and no implementation does right. Um, so I just, I'm going to pull out some of those to make it easier to implement. Um, but I'm going to have one definitive Acmeist parser grammar that's a PEGX parser for YAML. Um, and that means anytime we find a bug in the grammar, we fix it in one place and 20 languages win. Um, I have one definitive test suite and test ML. Um, you know, anytime we find something that's not working, we add a test, and then it serves 20 languages at once. So I, I went over most of that. Um, yeah, even I mean, even in Perl, we have incompatible implementations, and then um, you know, across languages, there's definitely some stuff to iron out. Um, <clears throat> Also, I, let's see, yeah, that's the next slide. So the whole load dump thing, I think, is pretty elegant from that perspective. But once you actually have to do more complicated stuff, it gets really ugly really fast. And there is no common API across any implementation on ways to do things like having keys sorted or um, 
and I, I, can't, I mean, there's like thousands of things that um, you could actually do um, in YAML and with no good way. So if you're at that load dump level, it's fine, and most people limit themselves to that, and thus they limit themselves to things like config files and um, just viewing a complex data structure. But, I mean, it, it was actually designed to be a lot more. So um, I'm going to reduce this by one. Okay, so not many people know, how many people know that YAML is a stack of processes? Anybody? Tom does, which I would expect you to know that, Tom. <clears throat> okay, so it, it is. Um, so at the top, you have um, native Perl objects, and at the bottom, you have a string of YAML characters. Well, it actually goes through a reader, a scanner, a parser, a composer, a constructor, and a loader conceptually. Now, YAML PM, just, you know, loader is all basically one thing. You can collapse those processes, um, but as we were designing the language, we actually designed it at these levels. Now, it's interesting because once you accept that, then you realize that you can go from um, reader up to a token stream, get the information you need out of tokens, maybe change a few of them, and then write them out to the next process in a kind of piped Unix process type of thing. Um, and actually, PyYAML, and I had a, a, a grant to port this to Perl and, and got it most of the way done, um, was called YAML double colon Perl, exposes this whole step. It was actually a direct port of PyYAML. So PyYAML actually exposes all of these as classes and you can interoperate. So um, a YAML node graph is almost a native object except for that the types aren't resolved, they're, they're left as tags. And, uh, how many people have even used tags in YAML? Um, Tom? Yes. So, um, and also the references, oh, at this point the references are actually resolved, so if you have duplicates, they point to each other and that kind of thing. Um, and then below that you have a token stream, and et cetera. So, so you can kind of like, it's kind of like TCP IP, right? You, you don't have to take it all the, well, is that right? I mean, nobody uses TCP IP that way, but there's, anyway, you, I'm not actually ignore that I said that, but um, you can actually do interesting things in Perl at each of these levels, just how far up the stack you want to go and how far back down. Um, but everybody just does the load dump thing currently. I would like to expose all that um, to the Perl world, and so this seems like a little bit of an aside, but there's something called JSync, and if you go to jsync.org, have you seen it? Okay, so the, the idea is JSON and YAML seem like completely different, and they are at a syntax level, um, vastly different at a syntax level, even though JSON at a syntax level and a model level is a complete subset of YAML except for one German who might be listening. Um, <clears throat> doesn't seem to believe that, but um, in the 1.2 spec, we made sure that um, all JSON was um, valid YAML. <clears throat> so the three differences at the model level are that JSON doesn't support references, so you can't have circular references or duplicate references of data. It doesn't support tags, which means you can't have typed class things. Um, and it doesn't support anything but string keys. Um, YAML actually supports objects as keys. You can have one big YAML hash as the key to another you know, YAML value. Um, everything is node to node in mappings. So where a node can be a scalar, um, a sequence, or a mapping, as we call scalars, arrays, and hashes in YAML speak. <clears throat> so I thought that this would, I, I thought of this idea, and I thought it would be a win because there's a lot of existing um, JSON implementations, and I didn't actually include a slide for this, so let's just go over here and look at jsync.org, if I can remember how to use Penadactyl, the Vim. It's Firefox's Vim, it's very strange. JSync. Okay. So it's basically, it's everything about JSync is in this one little page. And um, so you have these two pieces of, um, this is some complex YAML down here, and I'll, I'll blow it up a little bit um, so that people can see it. So here we have um, references. We have 
tags of things. This is a record. We have, that's a, a date tag. Um, <clears throat> things like that. And then you just put that little bit of extra meta information into um, special things. So if, if, a, um, if an array begins with a scalar that has one of these keys, then it's considered special. And it's actually not part of the array, but it's actually the type of that whole object. Um, and then if it, a mapping has the special key bang, then, um, or the special key at sign, then the bang is used as the tag and the at sign is used as the, um, the anchor, as we call them in YAML. So the idea was that you could get all of YAML serialization because that's what YAML is a serialization language, and um, JSON is defined, I think, as a, as a data and transmitting language. Um, but you could actually serialize in JSON with just these few changes. That was the idea. But I really had a little bit secret, different idea. I mean, I thought that people would buy into it because, you know, you could do full serialization in JSON. But I knew that then I could expose that stack layer through a really clean API and people wouldn't think, oh shit, it's another YAML thing, <laughs> right? So then I, I get it working, you know, and probably have you know other people to help me with that, so I wouldn't fuck it up again. And then, um, <clears throat> like Tom, Tom, Tom could probably help me with that. And uh, and then once we got it all working, then we we're like, oh yeah, we'll just make this the new YAML um, API, and we're done. That would be great. So. It's time to pair up, guys. Um, how many people got those staccato clients installed on their machine? Sorry, I didn't really give you much instruction on how to do it. It's a, it's a zip file with an executable in it. Um, you grab the one for your platform and... Um, what's that? Yeah, so say staccato help or something like that. Yeah. Oh, it's um, staccato.to. Stack a dot to. This is the way, so one of the things I'm going to say at the end is there's a staccato workshop tomorrow, and um, it's a two-hour session where we're going to do some really great stuff with staccato. Um, so if you can't get it working here, um, and I was, then yet you can come see Jan and I's thing tomorrow at 1.30. Is it 1.30, Jan? I think. Yeah. And, um, but I was trying to warn Jan that, like, people were going to have all kinds of weird troubles that we wouldn't expect, because I, like, the first time I did one of these, I thought, so what are we going to do after the first five minutes because it'll be so easy, you know? And then it's like one guy got it working out of 12 after, th you know, it's like crazy. That's not going to happen tomorrow. But, <clears throat> okay. So, um, okay, so let's pretend that staccato is in your path. And it's, um, and it's called S, because I alias it to S, because it's easier to type. So you would say S target. Oh, sorry, I wasn't on my own machine. OK. Um, OK, you'd say S target, and it's pointing at this target. If it's not, just say S target api.staca.to. Now, you really couldn't get any farther because I forgot to create you an account. So let me do that right quick. Okay. So this is actually the Staccato Admin Console. And so for those who hadn't seen it yesterday, it's got all kinds of neat graphs. And this is actually the, um, okay, um, Everybody look down for a second. I've got to go create a new user. And it's, don't remember the names of any of those users, because that would be leaking information. OK. Um, <clears throat> anyway, everybody's looking down. The German people are definitely looking at the floor. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Sorry. Um, let's call you guys uh, Yapsi at yapsi.org or something. It doesn't even have to be. Um, and, oh, shit. Can, can this be turned off somehow? You walk away from 
Can, does anybody know sign language? <laughs> All right. Somebody on the internet, I just realized, is not in this room and doesn't, is going to uh, delete my whole container while we're in it. Well, please don't do that, Germany or Netherlands. <laughs> Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. Could do that. Nah. Let's let's all be grown ups here. Please. <laughs> let's make it um um Yapsi N A, all lowercase. No colons or anything. Okay. So I'm gonna add a user, I'm gonna make it not an administrator which means they can't do too much damage, we hope. Right, Jan? Okay. Um, I'm going to add you to this group called pair up. Oh, no, I don't want to do that, right? I'm going to cancel. Sorry. <sighs> All right. That's what pairs are for, man. You guys, you know, you, that was great. You guys are awesome. <laughs> don't click that button. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah, add a user. What did I call you guys? Yepsi at yepsi.org? Okay, so here's what you're going to do. Um, you're going to log in, say s login, um, and it'll prompt you for your email address, yepsi at yepsi.org and um, yepsi.na. And Then you're going to say s group pair up. That's going to set your default group. And you can say s apps at this point, and it'll show the apps that are running. So here's some pair up sessions. I had one with Brock, and this is us. Um, so now you will say s ssh into um, pair up dash yapt. And I'm going to run a slightly different command. All right. Oh, right. Um, this is, okay. Cool. So I'm in. Now I'm going to type the word pair. Oh, okay. So, is, if, if you, who, who's SSH'd in, effectively? Just Tom. Okay. Um, now type the word pair up, Tom. What do we do for the application? Oh, you're already in. Okay, great. What do we do for the application name? Oh, sorry. Um, S S H application name. So basically. Control C, Tom. Control C, or whoever. Okay. Um, so, okay. So S login as Yapsi at yapsi.org. Password Yapsi NA. And then say S. I'll do that again. Say S. Are you in? Great. Um, try typing some stuff. I, usually, we came up with this thing when I'm pairing. I say um, blah blah blah, and then if I, I still have to talk, I type. Woo! Okay. This is good. Um, awesome. <laughs> this is going to be fun. So, um, here's here's something that we we added to uh, called Chat Up. I think this works. Yeah. This is really cool. So it took the name that we logged in as. Um, it went over to um, Freenode, connected to that, and now we have a split screen, and um, people can go to. Oops. It's trying to get into pound pair up on Freenode. And we could probably go into, um, can somebody do this for me? Tom, can you um, connect to uh, irc.perl.org and join pound Yapsi? I, I don't type so good, which is not good for acmeism, I guess. Are you, can, are you what's that? OK. I think you can say just slash connect. 
Oh, sorry. Okay. And I think we're going to have to re... <laughs> Let's... Um, I think our nick is going to be staccato, so we have to re-nick for this. So slash slash Nick um, pair up dash Yapsi. Actually, I'll drive if you, if you don't mind. Um, so you're you're in a TMUX session, which is like a screen session, um, but it actually has screen bindings, so that if you're used to use it working with screen, TMUX is super awesome, configurable. That's right. And so, like, if you open a new window over here, which somebody did, um, I'm going to kill that window. Um, the cool thing about, well, the thing I like about the, in the pair up meme is that, um, like, usually in screen, somebody could go start another screen and start hacking on the system behind our backs, but um, TMUX, everybody follows the same thing. Okay, let's get in a fight. Um, so, yeah, you would do. Um, Control A and then D to leave if you wanted to leave. Yeah. All right. Woohoo! Okay. Um, so I want to show you. Um, oh, fuck it. I'm going to show you PegX first. And so the cool thing about PegX is that it parses itself. Um, so PegX is a grammar language that you used to define parsers. Um, in fact, let me. Um, Let's look at a, a PegX parser for, for JSON, because everybody knows JSON. Um, yep. OK. And I'm going to make it a little smaller. Oops. Can somebody who's ever got that 24 by 80 make their uh, – takes the smallest one? Yeah. Just make it bigger than mine. Oh, is it catching up? So this is – this is the grammar in PegX for all of JSON. Um, a JSON, a piece of JSON is a mapping or a sequence. Um, a node is a mapping sequence or scalar. A mapping is this regex. So PegX, PEG stands for parsing expression grammars, and it's um, even Perl 6 calls its thing a PEG. It's, it's part P6 rules. Um, reg, regex stands for regex, so you combine the two, you get PegX. That's how PegX gets its name. Um, so a mapping is, this means any amount of white space um, with, a, with a left curly. This is the long way of saying a left curly. This means any number of pairs separated by commas, and this is a right curly. Um, a pair is a string, which we talked about before. You can only have a string key, um, colon with, white, with optional white space, a node, and a node we've already defined, and blah, blah, blah. Um, the long, there's a couple of long ones. String and number have a little bit longer, but they're pretty simple. And the cool thing about this is if, even if you don't understand all that, um, I compile it to YAML. So I compile a grammar, and it's just a really simple data structure. And actually, I compiled it to a data structure that looked really good when it was dumped to YAML. So um, that's why the little pluses and dots are for getting nice sorting. Um, so we saw before that a JSON was any of mapping or sequence. And all of the stuff that we saw, um, those regexes that we saw in the things, the things between slashes actually get turned into um, real PCRE regexes here. And so all you need then is a runtime that applies this grammar to a piece of text, and it parses it. Um, and then what does it produce? I'll answer that in a, in a little bit. So that's the whole um, deal. And I actually... You know, for the haters in the house, I have a – I dump it to JSON, too. No, actually, it's not for the haters. It's so, so you can write a PEGX grammar and then go um, – without writing the compiler in JSON, I could just use this and just write the runtime in JSON. So it makes it a little bit more portable for getting PEGX to languages quicker. Um, so the one uh, trick that I want to show you is – 
Oh, we should. I just need to say hi to everyone. Whoops. So yeah, you guys can actually ask me questions, I guess, through here or something like that. Um, somebody's still got a little bit, a 24 tall terminal. So if they could make that a little bit bigger, I'd have a little more screen room up here. Oh, did you guys do that to push me up? I get it, tricky. That's slick. All right, change it back. No, I'm just kidding. What? Okay. It's already pretty good because uh, we got the IRC on the bottom. So let me see if I can find this command control. Um, yeah, so I was actually playing with this to make sure it works. Um, okay, so have, has anybody heard of XXXPM? It's, you just put XXX anywhere that you want to dump something to the right of it. Um, and it's cool because you can put it in almost any context in Perl because bare words are so awesome. Thank you, Larry. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to use, this is pegx parsing the pegx grammar um, using itself because um, the grammar is right here. So if I run this, um, oh, actually, it's not going to work because we're not in the right directory. So I'll run it. I'll get an error. We'll see you too. Okay, there you go. So um, I can actually go up a little bit. We haven't even looked at the, the pegx grammar yet, so we, we probably should have done that um, first, but this is what it looks like when it's parsed and dumped to an AST. This is an AST for this grammar. Let me show you the grammar real quick. Um, so here's the grammar, um, and this is the grammar of the actual syntax that you're looking at. Um, Probably a rule definition is pretty cool because all of these things are rules. So rule definition is um, a rule name followed by um, a colon and then followed by a rule group. And so the things, and then followed by um, an ending, which is either a new line or a semicolon. So you can actually, actually, I think if you took all the white space out of this grammar, I think I have a test to do this, it still parses. So the actual white space in the grammar is, is not needed. As long as you have semicolons where the new lines are. Um, so this is a little bit more complicated, but that's the whole thing, right? Um, how many lines is that? 68 lines with half of them being blanks. Not too bad. Um, <clears throat> so there's one thing that, like, it's neat to see the data in this form if you're dumping to see what the tree looks like, but if you're actually using it inside of Perl, it means you have to pull off these, you write these callbacks and you have to pull off the key that it matched even though you already know what callback you're you're doing. So there's this thing um, for this command line stuff that I added called wrap is zero, which means it's not going to wrap it with the rule that it matched at that point at. So if we do this, we get basically the same thing as just a bunch of, what did I do wrong? Oh, cool. I love pairing. It's so great. You guys are awesome. So yeah, this is the same information. This is actually just the data that was matched without the rules matching it. So if you're looking at this, you wouldn't know what it was, but inside the program, it would be exactly what you want at the various points. Now, um, I want to show you a part of the PEGX implementation. So this is the PEGX, PEGX, AST. It's PEGX, PEGX, because it's PEGX, it's the top level namespace, and then it's, you know, if it, was, it would be pegx json ast, but this is pegx pegx ast. So basically, what you do is you just have a class that defines got rule names for all of the rules, and you get the data in, and you mutate it the way you want it to look at that point, and then you, you return it, and it'll start building a tree for you. So it's, re it's really pretty elegant. I mean, it, it gives you what it's matched at that point, and then allows you to morph that into something new. And You've seen this output already because when I showed you the YAML, um, this was actually the output um, dumped to YAML of what it produced inside of Perl. I'll, I'll show you what I mean. Um, another option I can add to this terse little stuff is the concept of what is the receiving class. 
that's going to receive callbacks, that has all the callbacks for all of the rule matches. So I say receiver is pegx. Oh, I need bad quoting. Right? Bam. Well, yeah, that's it. So um, we'll Oops, what happened there? Oh, maybe, oh, I see it, standard, yeah. Can I do two pipe? Is that gonna work or no? No. Oh, wait, yeah. Cool, no, maybe not. It's like, do I need that to redirect to Amper one thing? God, some, this is where one of you guys doesn't know this stuff. Okay, there we go. It's, it's not supposed to be me that's supposed to remember this shit. I don't. Okay, so this was actually the YAML output that you saw in pegx, peg, or pegx .pgx .yaml. Um You know, this is exact. In fact, if we split with that file, um, I'll quit. I need to pipe it into the lovely Vim. Wish I had Komodo, man. <laughs> um, this should be pretty much the same thing, right? So, anyway, basically, what what we what you saw there is every all of those things that got matched in that tree got passed to each of the callbacks, and the right thing was done with them to build them into this data structure that I wanted out of it. So if you're parsing a language, you know you just um, you're, you build an AST of the, that's usable by a runtime or something like that. Um, I mean, I'm not going to get too much into it. So that's basically pegx and um, I'll show you one more thing. I'll show you. Uh, has anybody has Anybody seen CDent in action? That'd be worth showing. Okay, because um, <clears throat> oh, actually, we still got eight minutes. So CDT testML is actually useful, and it's actually jQuery.pm that you know about. Um, it has all testML tests, and many of my modules now do have all testML tests, and that means that if they're Acmeus projects, when I go to port them to Python or whatever, that the tests are just going to work there. Um, <clears throat> I want it to go PM. I just want to... Um, okay. So that, those, I want to time that. It's not too bad. And this is on like a little tiny LXC container VM. Anyway. Not too bad, two seconds. So this was um, test running under testML. They were parsed with pegx in real time because testML is a pegx-based language, and it all ran pretty fast. So pegx is not too slow is, all, I guess, all I'm saying. Um, let's look at maybe some of the tests for this. So probably the best one is this um, function test. Testimel L itself is a, so plan <laughs> is only useful by the TAP um, framework, and it's actually, um, well, it's a scoped variable. It's actually a lexical variable, but there's an, um, TestML has an outer function wrapper, and so you can actually define closures in, in TestML, and um, this is the definition of a function here. It's, it's an anonymous function assigned to a variable, and then you call it down here like this. Um, and it has one magic thing in that a star points to stuff in the data section. And so this has an implicit loop wrapped around it. It's going to take all of the... Has anybody seen test base in Perl? Miyagawa uses it a shit ton, or used to, and um, I use it a lot. It's basically data-driven tests. And this is actually just... TestML is exactly this for all languages. Um, YAML has a ton of test base tests. And so these are the blocks down here. And not all of these apply to that line, but um, this would go and find all of the blocks that had a a color and a thing component, and then apply test two to that data at that point. 
and test two would make an assertion. So the equals equals is an actually an assertion, which on a TAP framework translates to an um, assert EQ type of thing, or an, you know, an EQ, sorry. So in another language, it you know, translates to whatever they do for equals assertions. Um, anyway, that's testML in a nutshell. And did I grab that? I didn't grab it. Uh, okay. Um, so testML is a compiler. And here's a bunch of um, example um, pieces of code. And some of them have a little bit weird names. Let's look at this guy. Um, okay. So here we have, a, uh, this is some JavaScript. We have a black comments. We have what's effectively a class um, with a greet method. And it prints a line of hello world. Um, if I were to take this input file, I could compile it to Perl 6 or a bunch of other languages. Let's see. So I say cdent minus minus compile. Um, this is my input file. So I say in equals this. So it's in and out or to and from. You have to have an, um, in this case, I, I want to say to. If I said out, then it would look at the extension of the file name to determine the language. But this just says go to standard out and pick a language. I'll, I'll, I'll use language X. It'll complain. I don't know what language X is, but I have these 20 others that you can pick from. Who? Somebody pick one. What? PY3. PY3. Okay. There we go. What, did I get that wrong? Yeah. There we go. So there's um, Python 3, and here's Parrot Intermediate Runtime. And um, here's Perl. Here's Perl 6. <clears throat> and I also have um, other input flavors. So I have Python, JavaScript so far, and um, Perl 6, because they had pretty clean grammars. Um, Let's go to PY. So there's Python. The way I did cdent um, is I define the language in memory. And then once you define an AST in memory that you can trust, um, then you can output equivalent versions of different code. That's the easy part. And then you have to define a language that will compile to that, and you're done. I mean, QED, kind of, right? So, um, And so I... I pick subsets of languages. So the, the idea with cdent is that you code to a very strict subset of Perl 6 or Python. Maybe it's just if, if statements and whiles. You know, I mean, it's, but you can get, you know, if you believe that your idea is good enough to code in a very boring way, then you can get the biggest audience possible. Another possibility with cdent is that we can output to C code. And the cool thing about that is if we do that, the excess binding or the swig binding that brings it back into Perl matches the exact API of the code that was written to produce that C code. So um, one thing about binding libraries generally is the libraries weren't made for Perl or Python. They were made for, you know, in the best way that a C programmer would do, and then later you just make it work somehow with some terrible API. So anyway, I'm kind of going to stop there and, and take some questions, and then we're all going to commit suicide. If, um, um, does anybody have a question? Yeah. Um, can you compare, like, do you know at all the memory usage of PegX, like, compared to, like, for instance, Park Rec, Rec Descent? I mean, that thing's gigantic, and, and this is not as huge. Oh, yeah, this is tiny. So this is, the, this has a, when you run it, it loads that YAML file of the grammar, sure. and it loads a 300-line Perl runtime, and then it loads the text that you're parsing. Well, you can definitely try it yourself. But um, yeah, yeah, I'd love to know your results. Um, I expect that it will be very fast, and I also expect that writing lib pegx will be quite an easy task because it was only, um, like I said, 300 or so lines of Perl. So 
And then once we have that, you know, the sky's the limit. Um, peg, peg parsing, actually, so I was sitting with Ward Cunningham, the guy who invented the wiki, he's a friend of mine, and he was showing me that he, he had an example of all of Wikipedia's data, and it was, it was some terabyte of data or something, and he, using pegleg, which was a C-based peg parser, could pull out data, and he could run the whole thing in, like, under five minutes, and it, or some blinding speed. It was unbelievable, like, how fast that he could parse stuff out, and what he would do is parse out information that was interesting to him for creating test cases for wikis and stuff. Anyway, um, I don't know. You know, I don't know. Cool. Let me know. I'd, and I'd love your help on working on it if you're interested. Right. Um, so now we're going to commit suicide. So, right. <laughs> you know, I'm going to actually use... So I'm inside of a pair-up session. I could actually start another pair-up session from within here easily, or I could launch any Staccato app. Um, so staccato.to... Oh, sorry. Um, oh, API, sorry. Um, okay, and then what do we do? We s login as me. Oh, let's, let's, let's log in as you. Um, I'll let you take me down. Was it yapsi.org? Um, do you want to type in the password, sir? In the red? That's it. You did it. Great. And now um, say S apps. Yeah. And actually, you'll get the apps. You have no applications because you don't have a group. So say S group pair up. And then say S apps. It's a little slow. Maybe somebody's beating us to the punch. I don't know. What's going on? That's weird. I'm going to try it. Yeah. Um. Hmm. I see. Oh no! I just I just created a new screen. Um, yeah, you're right. Um, whoa. Okay. Well, it worked. So now I don't know why we're lagged out. What? Um. Wait, it seems when I change screens, it, um, well, I'm going to leave it and go back in. Okay, does that help? Um, we can do it from over here. Screw it. Um, control A, C. If I can type into this one, I don't know. Maybe somebody's control key is stuck or something like that. That's a possibility, right? I don't know. Did somebody fall asleep on their keyboard? All right. Well, anyway, if you S deleted the app, <laughs> it would kill us all. Okay. 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 Um, Go ahead. Who's going to do it? Oh, S delete. Oh, yeah, yeah. Hold on. Yeah, move it up a few lines. S apps. Or show the apps first. Yeah. Oh, forget it. <laughs> okay. S delete. Pair up. Yep. Yay. Nice knowing you guys. Yeah. So.